Hello there. I'm Fred Leo, and I've had the pleasure of broadcasting University of Denver football games for the past two seasons. In that time, I've had the opportunity to see Denver University win 17 games, 20 starts. Now, that's a remarkable record, and I can assure you that the Pioneers have played sensational football. And now let's take a look at some of the records that this 1955 DU football team compiled while we take a look at the San the University of Denver campus. The Pioneers scored 310 points, second only to mighty Oklahoma in the national scoring parade. Denver was third in total offense, 12th in rushing offense, and fourth in passing offense. Jimmy Bowen threw 15 touchdown passes, tops in the nation, as he closed out a brilliant career. Looking back, it was a one-point loss to Colorado A&M Zeldin champions that cost the Pioneers a second consecutive Skyline title. Top man on the University of Denver scene is Chancellor Chester M. Alder, who in addition to guiding the educational destinies of the university, rates as DU's number one football fan, never missing a game at home or away when his schedule permits. Athletic director is Tad Wyman, one of the most respected figures in the college athletic world. A former player at Michigan and coach at Michigan, Minnesota, Princeton, and Columbia, he now serves as secretary of the NCAA Football Rules Committee. Guiding the football fortunes in 55 was John Ronning, new to Denver after four years at Utah State. A former star end at Minnesota and also an assistant coach with the Gophers, Ronning took the city of Denver by storm with a winning personality and a colorful team. Assisting Ronning is a capable staff of young coaches. Cal Stoll, an assistant to Ronning four years at Utah State, is the line coach. John Shelley, former Army star and assistant at Oklahoma in 54, tutors the backs. Bill Heiss, former assistant at Iowa State, is in charge of the ends, and Dale Hardy, highly successful coach at Trinidad Junior College, is the freshman coach. Jimmy Bowen, product of Carlsbad, New Mexico, is a sensational passing threat for three seasons and holds many DU all-time records. Sal Elizondo, center from Pueblo, Colorado, fought his way up from a four-string end position to a place of prominence on the team. Captain Ed Horvat of Denver, all-conference tackle in 54 and 5, was one of the best linemen to perform on the hilltop in many seasons. Chuck Olson, former Hartnell, California junior college star, not only was a standout tackle, but the team comedian as well. Charlie's smile is just a reflection of a teammate's face after an Olson-directed quip. Dick Herman, another former Hartnell star, was another valuable cog in a rugged pioneer line that led the Skyline Conference in overall defense for the season. Larry Ross, 6'5", 220-pound end from Duarte, California, was an all-conference performer for two years and was drafted later by the Cleveland Browns. Bob Berkey from East Denver High School was the kind of unsung hero important to every team. Tackle Moana Kalai, guard Jay Schnitker, and halfback Odell Rowling were part of the group of ten seniors and were not available when this film was being made. Denver flew to Ames, Iowa to open its season against a Big Seven opponent. It was one of the Pioneers' biggest opening challenges in years, and they came through with a 19-7 victory over Iowa State. The game isn't very old before the Pioneers get into a jam. Iowa State's first punt is down on the Denver 9, Quarterback Jimmy Bowen fumbles on the first play, and the Cyclones recover. Denver's defense is equal to its first test, and a handoff to right halfback Fred Ripple. Rich Muhaw, center from Chicago, comes across to make a fine tackle on the eighth. A running pass from Hanson to Sheldrop is complete to the Denver six. On fourth down, a quarterback keeper goes to the one-foot line. Willie Jackson of Rock Springs, Wyoming, leads a host of Pioneer tacklers. The Pioneers get out of their bad hole when on third down, Bowen kicks out to the Iowa State 46. Larry Ross hits the receiver, he fumbles, and Charlie Olson recovers. From here, the Pioneers move to their first touchdown of the 55 season. On the first play, Bowen passes to end Ernie Pitts, former high school All-American at Alcoppa, Pennsylvania, and Pitts sidesteps to the 28. Bowen takes to the air again with a screen pass to Al Yanowicz, right halfback from North Braddock, Pennsylvania. Al moves to the Iowa State 13. 
On second down, Bowen, one of the nation's leading passers, throws a bullseye to Larry Ross in the end zone, and Denver leads 6 to nothing. Late in the game, the Cyclones threatened to pull the game out of the fire, trailing only 13 to 7. Junior halfback Max Wilsey takes the ball, appears stopped at the line of scrimmage, but wheels away and races 63 yards to the clinching touchdown, and the Pioneers win 19 to 7. Denver opened at home the next week against Drake's Bulldogs of the Missouri Valley Conference. The Denver offense got rolling, and the fleet-footed Pioneer backs racked up a decisive 33-7 victory. Early in the first quarter, fullback Bill Korn of Chicago slashes up the middle for 16 yards to the Drake 13. Max Wilsey finds a big hole and scoots in, and the Pioneers lead 7-0. Later in the quarter, Willie Frank, another star from Alcoppa, Pennsylvania, is given a huge hole by a charging Denver line and goes through for 10 yards in Denver's second touchdown. In the second quarter, Korn again twists through the Drake defenses for a touchdown, and the Pioneers lead at halftime 19-0. Denver's defense comes into the spotlight in the third quarter when Bob Wegelin, a junior from Scotts Bluff, Nebraska, intercepts Ron Diedrich's pass and returns it to the Drake Four. A penalty sets the Pioneers back, but on first down, Wegelin keeps inside left end and moves to the 28. Halfback Tarzan Honor follows with a turnaround left end for the touchdown. Denver leads 33 to nothing. Drake scores once, and Denver wins 33 to 7. The Pioneers had their first taste of heartbreak against Colorado A&M's title-bound Rams. Denver led 19 to 6 in the fourth quarter, but two late touchdowns gave the Rams a 20 to 19 victory. In the first quarter, Gary Glick, A&M's all everything back, hit center for five yards to the Denver 22. Jerry Zaleski, another fierce running back, blasts through right tackle to the Denver 7. On fourth down, Glick smashes over right tackle for a touchdown, and AM leads 6 to nothing. Denver fights back in the second, and Bowen once again is the big man with a perfect toss to Ernie Pitts in the end zone. The kick is wide, and the score is tied at 6 and 6. The Pioneers go ahead at halftime 13 to 6 when Willie Frank comes up with the season's longest run. With the ball on the Denver 13, Frank takes a pitch out, gets around AM's left end, and speeds 87 yards to the touchdown. Willie Jackson does a brilliant convoy job for Frank on his long run. Denver apparently has the game sewed up early in the fourth quarter when Tarzan Honor twists brilliantly through the AM defenses for a 15 yard touchdown run. Denver leads 19-6 with 12 minutes left to play. The Aggies get a comeback drive going, however, and Jerry Callahan passes to Ronnie Lampson for a touchdown. It's the only touchdown pass completed against Denver during the 55 season. Rick recovers an onside kick, and the Rams, now fired up, push to their winning touchdown. Barnes scores from the five-yard line with just 48 seconds left. Rick's perfect placement gives the Rams the big game, 20 to 19. This was Denver's big test after its heartbreaking loss to Colorado A&M, but the Pioneers put on their best passing display of many years and won 61 to 13. As we pick up play, DU is ahead 7 to nothing on a 62-yard pass from Al Janowicz to Joe Strasser. Now Bob Wegelin fades, passes the ball, Willie Frank catches it, and the play is good for 62 yards and another touchdown. Denver leads 14 to nothing. The Grizzlies bear their claws in the second quarter with a touchdown of their own. Williamson cracks over from the one-yard line to complete a 71-yard drive. Right now, you're seeing the oddest play of any season. Bowen fakes to the fullback, fades, passes to Willie Frank. Frank makes a great run, and it looks like a 67-yard touchdown play. But the play is called back. The reason, the official admits that he lost the ball on Bowen's perfect fake. The Pioneers get their touchdown anyway when Frank tries his hand at passing and completes a 21-yarder to Ross. The Pioneers keep on scoring and lead at halftime 35-13. to They don't let up in the second half either. Just after the kickoff, Williamson punts to Willie Frank on the DU 29. He 
gives ground to the 16 before he heads toward the Montana goal, but there's no stopping him once he does. Willie gets tremendous blocking. Charlie Olson makes a sensational block getting two men in front of the Denver bench, and Dick Gupton throws a key block on the last remaining defender. Denver leads now 42 to 13. This game put the Pioneers near the top in total offense and scoring statistics, and they stayed there the rest of the season. The touchdown parade marches on. Al Yanowich makes it 48 to 13 with a catch and run of Bowen's perfect toss. The play covers 35 yards. The third team plays 25 minutes of the game, and for the first time, the Pioneers show they have really good team depth. Fullback Johnny Wilson, fullback from Mount Hayden, Colorado, plows over center and rambles 39 yards for a touchdown. The Pioneers' third string plays the final quarter, and the game ends Denver 61, Montana 13. They say every team has one bad game to get out of its system, and for the 55 Pioneers, the Utah game was it. The touted Redskins disappointed Denver followers with a smashing 27-7 victory. Early in the game, Larry Fields, a power-running sophomore fullback, cuts inside left end and rambles all the way to the Denver one-yard line. It takes a fine defensive play by Willie Frank to catch Fields, here, the Pioneers make a great defensive stand, but it isn't enough, and the youth score on fourth down. Quarterback Dave Dungan is piled up by the center of the Denver line on first down. On second down, Charlie Olson and Sal Elizondo break through to stop Fields. On third down, Herb Nacken is foiled by Olson as he tries right guard. Fourth down, Lou Mealy, Utah's smashing halfback, plows over, and Utah leads six to nothing. The Pioneers bounce right back with a 74-yard touchdown drive. The key play early in the drive is a pass from Bowen to Ross that carries to the Utah 47 and gives Denver a first down. Al Yanowich on a reverse turns left end to the Utah 25. Bowen then passes to Yanowich, who makes a great catch, and he is finally forced out on the Utah nine. Willie Frank goes straight ahead to the five. And then second down, Frank, and a great run, dodges inside Utah's left end and scores standing up. Lee Lovis, kicking specialist from Las Vegas, Nevada, converts and the Pioneers lead seven to six. Fumbles and interceptions keep the Pioneers in the hole for the next two periods and enable Utah to gain a permanent advantage. Here, the Pioneers stop a Utah drive at the nine, and it's just one of five such goal line stands made in the second and third periods. Just before the half, Frank passes to Larry Ross, who makes a sensational catch on the DU-40, but the half ends before this threat can materialize. The terrific Denver defense is finally broken early in the fourth quarter when George Wells breaks through to block Bowen's punt on the DU-12. Herb Nacken punches over from the one-yard line, and the Pioneers trail 20-7. The final, Utah 27, Denver 7. The Pioneers drew Brigham Young the following week. Denver played a superb defensive game and rolled to a 33 to nothing victory. The game is mixed with frequent fumbles and interceptions, but Willie Frank continues his brilliant running, and in the second period, he circles his own right end and rambles 60 yards to a touchdown. The run is nullified because of a penalty. The Pioneers drive to their first touchdown a little later and lead 7 to nothing. Just before the half, Bob Huber, a sophomore guard from Pittsburgh, breaks through to block Herb Pingree's punt on the BYU 25. Ross is again the target for Denver's passers. Bobby Wegelin finds him on the 5. He stumbles and is down to the 1-yard line. George Colbert scores on the next play and Denver leads at the half 14 to nothing. Bowen continues his brilliant passing in the third period. First, he throws to Pitts to set up a third down play. Jimmy throws a bullet pass to Ross, and Denver leads 20 to nothing. Just a few plays later, Denver gets the ball, and Bowen scores again, this time with a pass to Ross on the BYU 40. He goes the rest of the way to complete a 56-yard play. Denver leads 26 to nothing. Bowen has three touchdown passes in this game, and here he starts Denver's fifth touchdown sortie 
He throws to Pitts on the BYU 28, and three plays later with the ball on the 12, he fakes, then tosses to Pitts for the touchdown. Denver wins 33 to nothing. It was homecoming at New Mexico, but also a homecoming for Jimmy Bowen, a native of Carlsbad, New Mexico, and he again fires three touchdown passes. Here at the start of the second period, Bowen throws to Larry Ross on the New Mexico one. Frank scores, and Denver leads 6 to nothing. Denver gets his second scoring march going a little later, and Bowen again engineers the drive. Here he passes to Willie Frank on a screen play. Behind very good downfield blocking, he goes to the New Mexico 40. The drive culminates with a pass Bowen to Ross from the six-yard line, and Denver leads at halftime 13 to nothing. Denver wastes little time getting started in the second half. Ross intercepts Bobby Lott's pass on the first play after the kickoff. His lateral to Yanowich is ruled illegal, but Denver has the ball on the low bow 21. Bowen gets his sixth touchdown pass in the last two games right now. He passes to Yanowich to cover the last 20 yards, and a good block by Ross at the goal line ensures the touchdown. Denver leads 20 to nothing. The Pioneers gain 589 yards in this game, and here is a good example of how this tremendous total was accomplished. Bowen again passes, this time to Pitts, who makes a great over-the-shoulder grab. The play covers 35 yards to the low bowl 48. Johnny Wilson improving with every game, then slashes 16 yards to the New Mexico 33. Taking the same draw play, Bowen finds Ross all alone behind the New Mexico defense. The 33-yard touchdown pass connects, and Denver leads 26 to nothing. The Pioneers resort to an unusual play for their fifth touchdown. Dick Gupton starts the play on a straight-ahead drive up the middle. He fumbles, but Larry Ross is Johnny on the spot, grabs the ball in midair, and races the rest of the way to the touchdown. The play covered 84 yards. New Mexico scored its only touchdown late in the game, and the final was Denver 33, New Mexico 6. Denver's oldest rivals, the Colorado College Tigers, proved no match for the Pioneers this time, and the running men piled up an avalanche of touchdowns, even though the reserves played most of the game. The Pioneers get their first score on an 11-yard pass from Bowen to George Colbert. Denver moved the ball for 579 yards again in the CC game, and here is possibly the best play of the game. Keith Pocock, sophomore halfback from Santa Ana, California, takes a pitch out from Bob Wegelin, and he twists, dodges, and turns 57 yards for the touchdown. Denver now leads 14 to nothing. Early in the second quarter, Colbert powers around left end and goes 25 yards to the CC 20 before he's finally shoved out of bounds. On the first play after that, Bowen passes to Odell Rowling, a senior halfback from East Orange, New Jersey. Rowling takes the ball on the CC-10 and goes into the end zone unmolested. Denver leads at halftime 27 to nothing. In the third quarter, Bill Lawrence's pass is intercepted by tackle Bob Ball. He laterals to Lee Lovis, and Lovis fights his way to the CC-11. Look at the multitude of Denver blockers on this play. It was a fine run by Lovis, too. All the reserves are in now, and here third-string quarterback Bob Hewitt gives signs of future usefulness by throwing to halfback Reggie Kenyon, who slips the Tiger defenders on the Colorado College 40. He grabs the pigskin and goes all the way to score, and the final is Denver 60, Colorado College nothing. The Pioneers hosted Utah State in their homecoming fray, and although the U-Tags were out to humble their old coach, John Ronning, Denver won 39-6 in its best overall display of the season. In the first period, Jack Hill punched to Willie Frank on the Denver 19. Willie, on a very nice run, scampers all the way down the right sidelines to the Utah State 32. Six plays later, Max Wilsey is given a hole at left tackle, and Denver leads seven to nothing. 
DU stops a drive and then marches to its second touchdown. First, Bowen faking a kick throws to Willie Frank on the DU 20, and he runs to the 34. Then Bowen finds Ross behind the Utah State defense. Ross grabs his pass, is slowed down when Ken Harris grabs the towel he's carrying, and is finally down on the eight-yard line. The play covered 58 yards, and Bowen now passes to Yanowich in the end zone, and Denver leads 13 to nothing. A little later in the game now, Hill punched to Tarzan Honor, a little halfback from Trinidad Junior College, and Honor getting the ball fakes beautifully. He threatens to go all the way, but is finally swarmed over on the Utah State 42. It's Bowen to Ross again, but Ross is caught on the Utah State 10 as the half ends. In the second half, Utah State can't gain, and Denver takes the ball on the DU 33. Beautiful faking on this reverse. It's Willie Frank with the ball. A good straight arm by Willie as he races to the Denver 47. Now Dick Gupton goes straight up the middle to the Utah State 41. And now Bowen is ready for the clincher. He fakes again to Gupton, fades, and finds Ernie Pitts all by himself on the Utah State 6. Pitts scores, and Denver leads 20 to nothing. Almost the same play five minutes later, starting at the Utah State 41. Bowen fakes and throws to Willie Frank. He gathers it in on the 12 and goes over for the touchdown. Utah State boasted one of the Skyline's best backs in Jack Hill, and here he shows why. On the second play after the kickoff and the ball on the Utah State 24, Hill cracks over right tackle, eludes would-be defenders, and races 76 yards for the touchdown. And now get ready for the season's top one-man display. It's fullback Johnny Wilson who powers the Pioneers. First, he runs 27 yards to the Utah State 41. Statistics after the game showed Denver second in the nation in total offense. Wilson was a big reason why that was so. Now Johnny breaks away for 18 more yards. On third down from the 20-yard line, Wilson slides around right end to the seventh. But it was Dick Gupton, another fullback, who finally gets the scoring assignment. Here he crashes into the end zone from the four, and the Pioneers lead 33-6. With the reserves throwing up a tight defense, Denver gets its sixth touchdown. Harris passes. It's intercepted by Freddie Bohm, a junior halfback from Whittier, California, and he makes one of the season's best runs for the touchdown. The final, Denver 39, Utah State 6. Here's a game no Denver supporter will ever forget. The final score, Denver 6, Wyoming 3. What happened? Well, here we go with traditional Thanksgiving Day action. The game develops into a defensive battle with rugged line play predominating. Here, Jimmy Bowen, the season-long passing sensation, gets in a fine punting performance. He places this one out of bounds on the Wyoming one-foot line. The Cowboys get out of that hole, but a little later, Denver's second team gets a drive rolling. Bobby Wiggelin hits Joe Strasser and in from Chicago with a 14-yard pass to the Wyoming 45. Wegelin this time keeps the ball, fakes out both the cameramen and the Wyoming defenders and races 13 yards to the Cowboy 32. But the Denver drive bogs down and Wyoming takes over. A few plays later, Wyoming tailback Jim Crawford fades to pass. Charlie Olson, the Skyline standout at tackle, breaks through and hits Crawford. He fumbles and Larry Ross pounces on the ball for the Pioneers on the Wyoming 30. But Denver doesn't score, and we pick up the scoreless play in the fourth quarter. Denver threatens when Willie Frank gets a lateral, fakes a pass, and then decides to run. He cuts inside a pair of Wyoming Cowboys and steps 15 yards to the Wyoming 31. A fumble killed this threat, and now the Cowboys start a determined drive that will culminate with Mastro Giovanni's field goal. Here you're going to see the now famous hat trick play. Jim Crawford cuts around his own right end and is forced out of bounds. Notice the official placing his hat on the Denver 39-yard line. Notice the man in the parka picking up the hat on the Wyoming sidelines. Now notice the start of the next play. The ball is on the Denver 37, and it's first down for Wyoming. But the drive sputters, and Mastro Giovanni steps back to the 17-yard line and calmly places the ball through the uprights. 
The score, Wyoming 3, Denver nothing. Time to play, 7 seconds. It looks very much like a repeat of last year's game when Mastro's field goal with 2 seconds to play gave Wyoming a 23-21 victory, the only loss Denver suffered in 54. Now Pete Cutches readies himself for the kickoff. Notice the ball is blown off the tee. Now it's placed back on. Cutches comes forward. Notice the ball blows off the tee just before the kick. Cutches kicks anyway to honor on the DU-30. He returns to the DU-42, but the officials have blown the ball dead because it was forward of the 40-yard line when kicked. Wyoming must kick again. The time to play now, one second. Cutches this time kicks long to Max Wilsey. Wilsey takes the ball on the Denver 22. He returns to the Denver 33, where he's met by a host of Wyoming tacklers. He laterals the ball to Dick Gupton, and Gupton sets sail down the east sideline. He eludes Wyoming tailback John Watts at the Wyoming 45, but Watts, the fastest man on the field, takes chase. He catches Gupton on about the five. The two tumble into the end zone, and the officials rule a Denver touchdown. The Pioneers win 6-3. The final play covered 78 yards and completed a once-in-a-lifetime climax to a close, extremely hard-fought game. That final run stirred up a violent protest by Wyoming officials, and news of the wild last-second finish reached sports fans from coast to coast. For Denver, it marked the conclusion of a highly successful season, eight wins and two losses. In addition to their high national ranking in offensive statistics, the Pioneers finished 12th in the nation in total defense and 7th in rushing defense. They dominated every statistic in the Skyline Conference, team offense and defense, rushing and passing offense, and many others. Denver's 19 touchdown passes were tops nationally. The prospects for 1956 are good. More than 20 lettermen are coming back along with a group of promising sophomores. I hope that you'll plan now to join us here at the University of Denver for another successful season in 1956.